All right, uh, good afternoon. We're going to start. We actually had uh, more RSVPs than uh, there are people in the room, so I expect that probably people will walk in um, after the lectures we have. Um, thank you for coming to this. We've got a very distinguished guest uh, today. Um, he, he's one of the internationally most recognizable people in signal processing, um, top researcher. And um, so I'm, I'm going to keep my introduction somewhat brief. I made a list. His achievements speak for themselves. I'm gonna, I'm, but I made a list so I don't forget uh, one of the many fellowships and awards that he's got, just to, to tell you what some of the things he's done. So he's a fellow of the IEEE, he's a fellow of the uh, SBIE, he's a fellow of the IET, he's a fellow of Eurosid, he's won many, many awards, most recently the Humboldt Prize in Germany, the IET Achievement Award, he's won Signal Processing, uh, IEEE Signal Process, Processing Society Award. Um, Eurosip Award, they're, they're in the biography, I don't think I, I need to go through all of them. Um, he's published more than 700, uh, he's got more than 700 publications, and he's done pioneering work in a number of areas, that, especially the ones uh, he's going to talk about today. Um, we've, we've had the collaboration for a number of years now, a uh, very close collaboration. It's been an incredible joy, and still is an incredible, incredible joy to work with him. But most of all, he's a dear friend of mine as well. And uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Moines Amin to talk to us about uh, radar. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Professor Elias Damutanias uh, for the invitation. I want to thank the, uh, the head of school for supporting this visit also the, the faculty of engineering. So uh, this is actually my first uh, visit to campus. Uh, actually the second, the first one was very short-lived. Uh, but I have been uh, coming to University of Hong Kong for many years. And actually you see here, uh, that's one of the sponsors uh, of this research is ARC, where we won back-to-back -back, uh, proposals. Uh, I think exceeding probably one million, close to one million, so 500,000, 500,000, with Professor Salim Bozordam, who went on and, and won the Eureka Prize based on the work that we have done in Sri Lanka in 2011. Uh, so this is some of the sponsors over the years. Uh, Sri Lanka Imaging is still as, as, a, as an emerging area. Definitely, you can surmise that has tremendous applicability in defense and security, but uh, believe it or not, number one sponsor in the U.S. for this area is the police, not the defense. So we have been in this area for so many years, started actually in 2002, and uh, we won close to $22 million from the U.S. government, uh, especially in, in the DOD, the Department of Defense Agencies. And it is maturing, but it's still, as you will see, is a very difficult area to conclude. Uh, now, what happened in the last three, four years is that this area of healthcare and signal processing for, for healthcare also emerged, and we found out that all the experiences and expertises that we developed in the sensing through walls, sensing through buildings, can uh, easily transform uh, into elderly care and, and aging in place. So I'm going to start with some of the uh, strides made in through imaging. There's nothing I say today is classified or proprietary. I just want to put this to bed at the very beginning at the outset. Okay, so as I said, you know, seeing through also as, as probably the, the title explains, is that you are outside and you would like to find what's going on inside. Right? So the radar is outside the building. You know nothing about the building. You don't know where the holes are, where the stairs are, and things like this, and definitely don't know where the humans are. Right? And you would like to uh, extract this information from the radar returns. Right? So it's, it's not an easy problem. So I'm gonna start looking into the things, then I will move into the assisted living, where actually the radars, I'm gonna take them from outside the building now, it's, it's gonna be the radars inside the building looking at you, 
than trying to uh, be like your companion you know, at home. So there are uh, three books, in fact, I editing the, the three of them. The first two already out is uh, Troll Imaging, 2011. The uh, Compressive Sensing or Urban Radar, that's 2015. There is one appearing in three, four months that's actually Radar for Indoor Monitoring that captures the flavor that what I'm going to be talking about. So there are 15 chapters there written by the authorities in this field. So uh, why radar? So radar is just like red magnetics like your phone, right? But you know, it's an active uh, sensing, so it sends and it receives, right? So uh, it works in all weather, definitely penetrate clouds, small penetrate walls. Uh, otherwise, while you are here, you won't be able to use your phone. It's all electromagnetics. Right? Radar can measure velocity acceleration and provide you accurate distance measurement. Radar is sensitive to object whose net scales are a centimeter to meter. Right? Also, it's not uh, influenced by, uh, by thermal or lighting conditions. So in, in just basic terms, you know, so it is uh, radar, radio detection, and ranging, right? So basically what you do is that you, you send a pulse, transmit, it hits the target, it comes back, right? This is the speed of light, so you can find out what is the range from measuring the time delay, journey back and forth, right? So it's, it's really simple, right? Then the, uh, that's for the range. Now for the angle, then you basically form a beam. The beam can be mechanically rotated and be electronically <coughs> rotating using arrays. So I form a beam, then I look at the range, find out what targets in this angle along different range cells. The Doppler, which basically it is the underpinning concept of uh, elderly care, radar for elderly care, is basically the ability to measure velocity, right? So if the target is in motion, now the frequency that comes back is different than the frequency is transmitted. And the difference for Doppler frequency. So if you are the radar and I'm walking towards you, there's going to be additional frequency to one that you're transmitted. If I'm walking away from you, it's going to be a difference in negative. So this is really the key point because when we say radar for indoor monitoring, that just imagine a radar there looking at me. Right? All my arms, all the motion of my arms and my legs will generate different frequencies. And it is these differences that makes up the signature that can say the radar said this guy is lecturing. The only way this motion can get can come together is this person is he's not walking, he's not running, he's not sitting, and he's not falling. Right. So that is that is the kind of the essence of the, of the radar technology. So it's definitely started in, in World War II. Of course, the British uh, used it, but now it has kind of invaded our, our daily life in addition to the being of tremendous uh, service to the defense industry. So this is a radar in the airport. <coughs> Pulse stop a radar, you can see how now the size. Uh, this is a phased array. Now, can application definitely the weather radar, and then the police <laughs> measuring the speed, right? And this is the one that we're going to be talking about through imaging. So anyhow, so you are outside. So what is uh, the idea here is that you are outside and you have a radar. Right? A radar meaning transmitting electromagnetic waves. Right? So this is this is your radar. You're outside the building. So you're going to uh, send electromagnetic wave. It's going to go through the wall, the exterior wall. As it goes through the wall, it loses tremendous amount of power. But that depends on the wall. Right? There are friendly walls, and there are not that friendly walls in terms of their influences on the, on the waveform. Right? So it makes a journey inside the building. So it goes through, let's say, if this is the exterior wall, it comes through the building, it's going to hit me. 
and then is going to make a journey back through the exterior wall again and loses more power. So that is exactly what's going on. Now, it depends how far the radar is from the building. Sometimes you cannot get very close to the building. Logistically, it's very dangerous, it's impossible. So you're 100 yards, maybe 100 meters away, 50 meters. So it depends on the stand of distance. You can get very close to the wall. In fact, you can put the radar against the wall. Or you can step back a little bit. In fact, you can do it on the move. In fact, you have a van, right? That's carrying the radar and have and goes as it uh, moves parallel to the wall. It collects the information. So, if, if, what is the application for indoor? You know, if, if you want to say, well, I want to find out whether there's somebody walking or running, or fighting. <laughs> so I, I showed you the Doppler, right? The Doppler because of the motion. The Doppler frequency is really related to the velocity, right? right? So you can take this Doppler signal and, and play it acoustically, right? If you play it acoustically, you can actually let your ear be the classifier. So, This is how a walking Doppler, this is, would be running. So if, if I'm outside and I am hearing these things, I can say this is a running signature. How about this one here? Of course, that's it is fine, but it's, it's not accurate enough. And uh, once you do it acoustically, all sounds would be an interference to you. So that's not what we're going to do, right? But uh, this motion again, the radar are able to collect the Doppler frequencies, right, from the different parts of the body, right? have kind of uh, invited radar to play a fundamental role in assisted living, right? So actually, this is a retirement home where we took our radar so this is our radar here into the retirement home and this uh, uh, lady, uh, you know, the auto volunteers you know, they're very curious about what we were doing so we asked her to move, she was moving, walking with the cane, right? We'll have to find out what is the radar signature of a person walking with the cane? And you will see some of the things here. So, so the idea here is that we will be able to learn a lot from the gate abnormality. Uh, radar is being used to characterize uh, multiple sclerosis where the person has difficulty lifting the foot from the, from the floor. But the most important one that we are looking at is falling. So, this is a lady, right? And she's falling. This is actual, actual fall. So, can the radar, being there looking, right, can it, can it discern that? This is a fall and alert the first responder, alert the family member, alert the daughter, the son, the neighbor, right? That listen, there is a fall. Now, I, can, I will show you that we can definitely find out whether it's a fall or not, but the problem is, it's not 100%. Right? So it's a false alarm. The false alarm is a major problem. Why? Suppose somebody is sitting and the radar thing is falling. So all the first responders come in and the person sitting down drinking tea there's nothing wrong, right? So what stopping this technology from being on the market is the false alarm rates. That's why you know, I'm working with uh, Professor Butanias to look into some other uh, ideas to help reducing this false alarm rates. Would like to find out the human daily activities. Bending, sitting, walking. 
So the radar there will be mounted in the corner, in the ceiling, right? Sidewall. And he's a constantly classified. This person is sitting. In fact, he can be so specific to you because he's monitoring you day and night. He becomes your companion. He's going to focus at, at uh, Professor Elias, the way he sits, the way he stands, the way he eats, the way he falls, right? Because he's different. The way he sits is different than where I, you know, the way I sit, right? So you have somebody there watching the person. That's why I call it the asogram. It's even beyond cognition. Cognitive radar goes beyond that. He's going to be specific to you. Right? And he's going to learn. The more it looks at you, the more it's going to learn about your gross motor activities. So it's going to be specific, it's going to be personalized. Right? That's where we are going with this technology. Right? But we can reserve this to the uh, few minutes uh, you know, before, before the conclusion of the talk. But let's go back to the urban sensing. So there are three ways to, to look inside buildings. One is ground-based. We talked about it being uh, at a different standoff. This is definitely zero standoff. This is very close. I mean, against the wall, you have the airport and you have the uh, ground based. But now, what we'd like to do, taking our experience, bringing the radar now from being outside to being inside so we can apply it to assisted living. Now, the basic principle of imaging through walls is so simple. Right? So, you are outside, you are looking, you say, well, this pixel over there, is there something there? Right? So you have, a, you have a transmitter or multiple transmitter. You have multiple receivers depending on the radar platform that you are using, right? So you're sending a waveform, go through the, the wall. As it goes through the wall, two things happen to the waveform. It bends because of the reflection, refraction. Right? It's different epsilon, different directing constant, and it slows down. If you ignore the effect of the wall, and instead of seeing Professor Elias here, I'm going to see him five chairs away, right? That is the effect of the wall. Definitely, it has lots of dispersion effects if it is cinder block and other things that you would see. So we say, well, if, if there's something there, so if I send an electromagnetic wave, and if it hits the target, it comes back received by different receivers. If you hypersize there is something there, then you delay the different signal received according to its position, such as that they line up. When they line up, you add them. When you add them, you magnify. magnify. When you magnify, you look at it. Is there something there? Did it cross that threshold? If it is, that means there is something there. That's detection. If you line them up coherently, by applying relative delays such as that all of them arrive at the same time and you sum them and they don't cross a threshold that means there's nothing there, you move to the next pixel and so forth so on. That's basically radar imaging, there's nothing more than that. And just to tell you, the total delay will be that through the air, back and forth, through the wall, back and forth. Okay, so before you launch a through wall imaging, you have to ask uh, yourself, uh, you know, again, is it airborne, uh, pickup based, or uh, handheld? What is the aperture? What's the loss in the wall? Am I seeing a combatant, somebody, uh, or, or an uh, outlaw, or whatever it is, you know, police application of defense? Uh, the multi pass is a major problem. So, this is the type of the questions that usually asked before uh, launching the system. Now, as I said that we have been in this business for almost uh, 15 years, right? And we have been part of different programs, and different programs have different objectives. One objective, for example, building interior, is not, uh, is not interested in people, it's not interested in chairs, right? It's interested in the blueprint of the building. 
So just imagine uh, you have a two-story building. So this objective will be finding the stairs, the doors, the windows, the walls, interior walls, perimeters of the rooms, such as that in the storm, the building, they know where they are. They're not interested in anything else. So that is imaging of building interiors. Actually, that's the first program that launched by DARPA. The second one is very interesting. He's not focused on the interior walls. He's focusing on the intent of the building. Can the reader from outside discern that this is a lecture hall? That all what needs to be to understand. By, by surveillance for two, three hours, can discern this is a kitchen, this is a living room. It's called the building intent that was supported by the army. So that is not easy because there are a lot of factors you have to bring it to bear. The other one is detecting personnel. This is actually the Canadian defense. Right? So they want to find where the people are, how many of them. There's always an interesting They call, they call him about the, um, <laughs> the audio thing. There was a, an interesting uh, setting here. There is, there is a good reason why this lady is sitting down and this person is leaning against the wall. Uh, when a person is leaning against the wall, it's very difficult to find him. That's why it's very difficult to find snipers, because snipers are against the wall and they hold their breath. So you'll find personnel doesn't matter, uh, thin, big, tall, short, standing, kneeling, sitting, running. Right? And uh, we said that this is a cross-disciplinary because signal processing is not going to be able to do this alone, right? The electromagnetics and antenna design, in fact, have a much better role to play in this area than signal processing. So this computational electromagnetics can tell us what will be the radar cross section, which is a scattering uh, of uh, a person standing and sitting. By the way, the strongest scattering comes from the back. Your back is the strongest scattering. So that's through the angle. So if you were to find the weakest is from the side. So there is a difference. So if you wanna, if you're outside trying to find the person, depending on orientation, is gonna be the the strength of the reflection. And this is the uh, same thing. Now, in terms of uh, thin, thick, and, and, and normal, fat and thin, so this is kind of frequency response right, of the three human looking from the front. And they, they are different. Right? Uh, so there is a, a, a difference in the scattering depending on, on the. So finding personnel. Uh, especially armed personnel, and uh, is any, one of the objective again is to find whether there are somebody with a weapon inside. Actually, we bought, you can buy AK-47 uh, from the web, but without the magazine. So we bought that and we modeled it. Uh, with, uh, because you don't know where the orientation is, you have to model and find out the scattering from different angles to see what's going on. Now, in terms of, uh, again, the Doppler, different parts of your body will generate different Doppler frequencies. Uh, most important is the arms, because right? the arm holds the weapon. So that is, uh, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the, at the swinging of the arm signature. If somebody is walking without swinging the arms, right, you could be, you could be holding a weapon, it could be a hostage situation, you could be holding something one arm swinging the other. So the swing of the arm can be negative to things of interest, let's put it this way. Okay, so uh, detection motion again, this motion, I, I mentioned to you about the intent of the building, right? So if I am sitting there, I use my hands when I lecture, right? So for, the, for 10 minutes, 
all what the reader is seeing is somebody using, you know, waving his arms, waving the hands, putting one, taking one a step forward, a step backward. So this guy is either crazy or he's lecturing, right? Because nobody would be doing this for some other activities. And definitely looking into uh, earthquakes and uh, people buried under the wreckages. So here are some systems that are out there in the market. Again, nothing classified here. Okay. This is like a needed defense through the wall radar imaging. Right? You can see very interesting. This is uh, two transmitters, eight receivers. So when you have eight receivers, you can resolve vertically, multi-story building, and then the vehicle is on the move, so actually it resolves in this azimuth. So vertical, uh, get the vertical, get the horizontal, get the elevation, you get the azimuth. Uh, I put this just for Andrew here, differential GPS is the only thing I'm going to talk about GPS. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then things here. This is the, uh, the US Army vehicle. This is very interesting. Actually, it is a ground rotating radar, and through what imaging is two transmitters and 16 receivers in the middle. If they point forward, it's forward looking GPR. If they turn it around, it becomes through the wall imaging. The way they transmit it, they transmit you know, sequentially. So this transmit transmits first, then this guy transmits second. If you are in MIMO, systems, this is a MIMO system because of the sequential firing. So the aperture is much longer than the 16. This is uh, Dr. Eureka uh, award that the Professor was talking about. This is the Eureka actually Aerospace uh, Corporation in, uh, in the US. It is an ultra wide band from 300 to 600 gigahertz and just transmit receive. So this one can image an AK-47. Now, handheld. Now, this is the way they're going with it now, is that you have the uh, operators. Each one is holding a radar. Uh, one of the standards say the radar has to be light enough such that a female soldier can carry it in the, you know, her left arm, so the right arm can be free. So uh, this is the L3 communication. It's very powerful. The radio. This is an Italian, actually two transmit and 16 <coughs> channels, 16 or 17 channels at the middle. Right. This one can detect breathing behind walls. This does not detect breathing. This is the Israeli uh, Sabre 800 from the Camaro technology. This is a British, the Press 200 from the Cambridge Consultant. This is a from Lockheed Martin. But you can see, by the way, the range is no secret now that probably on your own you figure it out what is the best frequency band to send through walls huh? from 1 to 4 gigahertz. If you go higher in frequency, you are wasting your time and you are wasting your money because they are not going to go through walls. This is very interesting. This is actually, it's a suitcase, right? Where this through an imaging, this four antennas, you can fold them, put them in the suitcase, carry the suitcase, then you open it, unfold it, and then put it again. So this is by Aquila. And definitely the airborne. Okay, so walls, major problem. Why? They, they attenuate, they reverberate, and the create ghosts. Ghosts, very problematic. Right? If somebody's looking at me from outside this door, right, he's going to see me four people. One, the genuine target. How about the other three? My reflection from this wall, from this wall, and from this wall. So all of a sudden, you don't know whether there is one or there are four and where exactly the target is. So ghosting is a major problem. I will show you actually a date in a second. Uh, so the attenuation and reverberation is not important. So walls, 
depending, I don't know about Australia, but we know what's going on in, in America uh, in terms of uh, exterior wall and houses and interior wall. Interior wall is the plywood, exterior wall sometimes cinder blocks. Uh, this is the most unfriendly wall. It is a hollow cinder block because of the air gaps it can trap the signal and keep shooting back at you. So cinder block is a major problem. Like this. These are the curves showing you the attenuation of frequency. I say you are wasting your time, you are wasting your money because you can see really after that there is a major, you know, it, this is one way attenuation. So at two gigahertz, you know, you are losing 15 dB. That means you're losing 50 dB in back and forth. Major problem. So just to show you, get a feel of what's going on, what the wall does to the electromagnetics. The first movie shows you the uh, a solid concrete. Right? So this is the waves comes. This is a wall. This is a target. See the wave front is very intact. This is reverberation. You see that reverberation here from the wall? So the wall will ghost. The wall itself is going to be ghosting. And then the target walls will be ghost. Not because of the side walls, it's because of front walls. So you have additional ghosting reverberation coming from it. Now take a look at the cinder block. It is the same thing, but now I have the, the hollow thing. It goes in. Look at what's happening. Look at all this, it's disturbing. These are actually gaps, gaps in the angles. That means those angles won't exhibit scattered waveforms. Right. So they'll be blind. So before you, that's why we always say in this type of problems, and problems that we're working with Professor Elias, there is no substitute of real data. If you don't have real data, you're solving the wrong problem. So this type of problems, you cannot sit down and just drive the criminal raw bomb. <laughs> and nobody's going to give you a million dollars to claim to drive the criminal raw bomb. The criminal bomb can be part statistical, part of the, the effort. Right? But this electromagnetic modeling that, that solves Maxwell's equation numerically it cannot it can be more exact. Right? So why should I build walls and I, mean, I can model it accurately, 100%? So before I design my system, I know exactly what the problems are. Look at the reverberation. So we have a target behind the wall, and this is actually our scanner. The price market of this actually is three hundred thousand dollars in the market. You have you can you can uh, uh, create any topology of the array. But uh, this is how there is a target there. I cannot see the target because the reverberation of the wall. Multi-pass, I mentioned to you about the ghosts. Right? And here is the real data from the Canadian system. Right? So they have this building. This is the wall types. There are two human standing there. And then I have their system driving by, doing collecting data at a certain position. This is synthetic aperture radar, as if you have a physical aperture. And this is really what you get. And take a look at this. This is a real image. They're looking for people. They're not going to tell me that, yes, of course, there are two here. Right? But they know where they are. That's why they put circles. Right? But look at the ghosts. All this garbage comes from, by the way, the, uh, the windows have uh, metal screen for mosquitoes. Right? That's why I actually see a strong reflection from the windows. Right? But this is a real image. Good luck. The conclusion of this area is unless the target is in motion, it's a very difficult problem. Here, the two people standing. The two-story building. So what, the, what they did, they modeled this electromagnetically. Uh, every single thing, the bed, the chair, the door. And they say, well, I'm going to do airborne. So the, again, simulated electromagnetic waves coming down. This is 40 degrees, as well 60 degrees elevation. Looking at the building. Right? And see, let's find out whether what we can see. Don't forget, 
This is the same pattern I showed you before. Uh, they, they found nothing. They, put, they couldn't see nothing. Uh, right? So where are the people? They are the people. They couldn't see them. There is no reflection from people. Uh, this is elevation, side view, and front. You will see here, this is a scattering with different colors. right? You see lots of scattering from the corners. Because electromagnetic wave comes in, it's like a di dihedral huh? or trihedral. It comes in, it gets reflected and shoot back, shoot back exactly the same angle. So the most visible targets from up in the corners of the wall, which is fine because you can always, if you get the corners, you can draw a straight line and say, this is a wall. <laughs> right? So this is called dihedral. This is called trihedral. So you see some by either here, but it's, it's not really good news at all. By the way, none of those people were moving. Now, this is another, this is real data, so I'm switching between electromagnetic and so this is real data. This is actually the Italian system. And it's against the wall. And it's a reinforced concrete. And there's somebody here is going to be sitting and standing and moving. And it's very interesting because you can see the person. So he's sitting. Look at this. He's sitting here. Look, look at the ghost. This, this firing is a ghost. So now he's moving. Circle is where it is. This is the estimate of the location. Right? Look at the ghosts firing. The ghosts are usually close to the walls, by the way. So he, he, he stands. This is standing now. So he was sitting. He moved. Now he stands. Right? This is behind concrete wall, so this is good news. But he's moving. Now, even if he's sitting, he's swinging the body and he's breathing. So. Once the target is in motion, this is doable. Now imagine now if I take the radar inside, so I don't have to worry about the concrete wall. That's for now human monitoring. That's a different area. I have tendency to talk forever. So how much time I have? Actually, I left my phone. Not 1:42. I have to speed up a little bit. Yeah. So another area that we started actually and it was the subject of the second ARC grant that one also got. Okay, so I was at the briefing at the Navy and uh, the, uh, again, by the way, we, we are at university, everything we do, we publish, right? Uh, and and it, it came out, you know, this whole area of compressive sensing, right? Uh, sometimes, People want to, because they want to publish, they want to get tenure and get promoted, they make up problems and, and to solve it, right? But not this one. This is a real problem. Which is basically is that if you have a uh, if you have a, a SAR system, a big outside carrying the radar and it's on the move, and it transmits different frequencies. So what we see here, there are different frequencies, right? These are different frequencies, right? Then it moves. And, and transmits different frequency. It moves, transmit different frequencies. That's what it is, really. That's how the Canadian system works. That's how the, uh, the our research lab system, right? So at the very end, you have collected, you have collected data and frequency, and in space, use this data to find out. That's imaging. Remember, that's the imaging. Now all of a sudden. So M number of antenna position, N number of frequencies, right? So frequency, you can, you can send a white band pulse, or you can synthesize it using different frequencies. Same thing. Now, all of a sudden, imagine the following, right? So you are trying to look through a building, and there are cars parked. Right? Remember, this is urban. This is not desert sensing. This is urban sensing. So that location is gone. A big tree, a light pole. So that, that location blind now. We cannot really see anything because it's not going to get into, into the building. So those positions are taken. What else? 
you're operating in the city, right? You are either infringing on someone or someone is infringing on you in terms of frequencies, right? Because you cannot call everybody and say, well, I'm doing imaging, so everybody turns off his phone and things like this. Right? So some of the frequencies are taken. Some of the position are taken and some frequencies. So that's how the problem is presented to us. Many years ago. Right? So all of a sudden, instead of having all this data available to you, you have a bunch of frequencies and a bunch of locations and good luck with your imaging. This can be only 3% of this. So how can you do beamforming? How can you do back projection? How can you image with 3% of the data? Business as usual will give you garbage. Beamforming, it's not going to give you nothing. Right? So you have to think about something else. So. I say this is actually being for the set point spread function if you do uh, uh, the adjoint operator. But the, but the good news is the following. Right? How many people in this room? I say 15. Oh, that is uh, a small occupancy. That means the targets here are sparse in space. Only 15. Out of how many pixels? 150. How many chairs? I don't know. Now suppose that Professor Elias stands up and moves. If I subtract the imaging now, and imaging a minute from now, everybody's gone except him. So the change detection makes him the only target in town. So I don't care about everything that are gone. The background is gone by the virtue of subtraction. That's sparse and MGI, motion target indicator. Now, when he moves, he moves with the speed. His speed is sparse. Why? Because there's a finite possibility of speed. He's not going to run. Right? So sparse in speed. Sparse in MGI is sparse in speed. So all of a sudden, say, yes, I give you 3% of the data, but guess what? What you are sensing has sparse property. How can you use the sparsity to make your radar sparsity aware? If the weather is sparsely aware, not sparsely blind, then there's good news. You can solve the problem. So that's what it is. So we selected. This is, remember, we, we picked 3% of the data. That's true. It's called the measurement matrix. So this it relates the observation vector with the scene. Now, the scene, I can transfer it into uh, another, using another basis, make it even sparser. Right? But all of a sudden now, I don't have all the observation. I have a small percentage of it, like this we said, right? So uh, we can solve it by, this is how I can solve for the scene, right? Uh, I pick the, the answer such as that it fits the data as close as possible in the, in the least square sense. But I do the regularization saying, out of those so many solutions that I have, I pick one that is the sparsest, the sparsest solution. Right? So the L1 norm somehow uh, highlights, encourages, and promotes sparsity. So that's how I solve the problem. There's so many things, and uh, for the interest of the uh, of time, uh, I'm probably going to come to it. Come to it when I when I have time at the very end. So this is a small conclusion. The state of knowledge now is that the thrown imaging devices are not uh, are not to satisfaction. So the problem is not solved yet. That's why I review every week. I review a paper from China on thrown imaging. You know, everybody doing thrown imaging in uh, in China uh, and in, in many areas in, in the world, right? Because it's not difficult. You can you can buy a, a a radar for 5K, 10K, you can even do it uh, in your own lab and get the real data. Okay, let's move to assisted living. Now I'm going to take the radar from inside and put it inside. Right? So why is this important? Because the ratio of the population age 65 and older to the population age 20 to 40, that ratio is going to reach 40% into 2050. 2050. Uh, and as I age, this uh, area becomes more interesting to me. <laughs> uh, 
So every 13 seconds, an older adult treated in the emergency, emergency room to the due to falls. Every 20 minutes, an, old, an older adult dies from a fall. $45 billion, total cost in 2016, expected to, uh, to rise to $67 billion by 2020. So can the radar, you said the radar is very good in finding the Doppler frequencies and all the things, so why can't the radar tell us that somebody fell? So the first thing is that can you, uh, the people who are at ME, mechanical engineering and studying uh, kinematic modeling and things, you can actually uh, model the different motions very accurately. Uh, so one thing is uh, walking, for example. So when you walk, this will be the velocity versus time. This will be your foot, you see. The highest frequency, the highest, the, the highest velocity comes from your foot. This high velocity, look at this high velocity. The second to it, that's your knee. Then the arm, then the shoulder. In fact, you are able distinguish with a man, a male and female walking from this way of the shoulder, comes the shoulder. So this is more than left, right, left, right. Now, it, when it comes to what I'm going to do now, signal processing, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to get the data, right? I want to find out, I'm going to get the Doppler, because the Doppler is related to the velocity, related to the acceleration, related to the hardware order moments. Right? So what I do, remember, I'm interested in the local behavior of the signal. What's happening now? What frequencies exist now? Not what frequencies exist in a period of tough time, right? Because this is an instantaneous behavior. So to do that, I cannot apply the Fourier transform. Because I'm not interested in the signal mecha, the frequency mecha. That's not, I'm interested in the local frequencies, right? So what you do is so easy, right? You apply a window and say, I'm going to just do the Fourier transform of the window data. That gives me the local behavior of the signal. Right? If I take my two square, it becomes a spectrogram. There are so many other methods, but I'm not going to go over it. Let's talk about the spectrogram. So the spectrogram reveal the frequencies over time, how they change. But the frequencies are Doppler frequencies, so they're related to the velocity. So the spectrogram will reveal the velocity acceleration. So now take a look at this. This is actually a system 224 gigahertz wide band with 500 uh, megahertz bandwidth. Uh, by the way, <laughs> the lab, I, I, st I, I start as a, as, a, as a subject that then the students would get in and then would do. So this is uh, so I'm just walking just to show you the difference between modeling and the exact, this is a gate. Right? So I'm just walking now. So this is now how it looks. So all of this nice sinusoid with the knee, with the arm, with the legs are gone, right? All what I see actually is my foot. This is the foot. The arms and the soldiers are all buried inside, but this is the real data. Now, if I, if I zoom in, this would be, I'm walking towards the radar, right? So this is, this is my foot. This is my knee, huh? this is my knee, look at the knee. And usually, by the way, because we have a nurse that comes in and trains our students how to walk like an elderly, so an elderly does not swing the arms, right? So the elderly walks slowly and the arms, the arms are not gonna show. Right? Now, interesting, this is walking towards the radar. You can see the sign you saw it, by the way, this is positive frequencies, right? Because if the radar is here, I'm walking towards this is positive. Why there is no negative frequency? Because you don't swing your leg backward unless you're a trapper. So when you walk, it's always positive if you're going this way. If you're walking around the radar, it's always negative. Right? So I see there is no negative foot. There's always positive foot because you don't swing your leg back. But what is interesting that we found out, if I walk away from the radar, look at the difference. 
which is a completely different signature, is no longer a sinusoid. We said, wait a minute, why, when I walk towards the reader, I get a sinusoid type behavior? Because like a pendulum, huh? And then I walk away, I get this awkward, really awkward behavior. Then we sat down trying to explain it because when the reader looks at your lower leg, there is a there is a dihedral. Look at this, it hits my upper leg, then the lower leg in a dihedral type of thing, like a wall. Right? And that's responsible for this behavior. We just found out this three months ago. Nobody, nobody until then had figure now, there is a difference between the gate, if you look at it coming to you, and look at it going away from you. So, this is walking with the king. Can a reader discern that this person walking with the king? Very interesting, look at this. This is supposed to be the foot, but look at the thick, Thin, thick, thin. Why thick, thin? Because the gait is in sync with this leg. But it's not exactly in sync. Right? So there's a dispersion, there's a delay. The delay causes the broadness of it. So if I have a classifier and say, take a look at the thick, thin behavior, and say, well, this person's walking with the, with the cane. That's how you proceed, sir. Well, uh, This is, I'm trying to distinguish the cane from the leg, so the cane is not in sync with either, with either leg. So this is, as I showed you before, this is looking at the person without the cane from the back, walking away. Now, if the person walking with the cane, look at this. This is a leg, a leg. Well, this is a leg, a leg, a leg. But look at the cane. The cane is sinusoid because the swing. Because the cane does not have the anatomy of the, of the leg, does not have the upper and the lower and the knee and things like this. So the cane is sinusoid, but the leg has this spiking behavior. Very strange and very interesting. It's not seen in the forward looking. So this is bending. Look at the bending. You can appreciate the rhythm. Look at the bend. When you bend, the upper part of your body going forward, that's positive power. The lower part of your body goes negative, backward, negative. The same with this time. So the beauty of this is, wait a minute, yes, it's obvious, now I can see it. Falling and sitting. This falling, the highest doctor comes from your head when you fall, because this is a high swinging. And then you have the knee. Fast sitting, it's like both of them like a tornado touching down. See, but wait a minute. So this is a spectrogram, right? This is time and frequency. They look similar. The classifier is gonna get confused. You're right. Slow. Falling and fast sitting will have very similar Doppler signature. So how can I distinguish them? I say, wait a minute. If you sit, what is the range displacement? Well, it's as deep as this base. That is the range extent. But when you fall, obviously that's your entire height, at least part of it. So if you have a range Doppler radar, a radar that can measure the range, it can measure the extent of the motion, and then it can distinguish between them. Look at this, the setting. So they are similar in the Doppler, but look at the displacement. So I can use all the things as features in my classifier. This is a range, range Doppler domain. You can see, if you start here, the maximum range with the maximum Doppler, because this is where the head. The maximum velocity when your head touches the floor, because like a pendulum, right? and this is the maximum range. So there is a difference between sitting and falling. 
Then you start looking at uh, you start I have a minute or two left. So you start thinking about the features that what we're working with uh, Professor Elias about, you know, what kind of features because you are good as your features selected uh, are. So what kind of features that you're going to give? Because this far can be anything, can be support vector machine, can be nearest neighbor, can be anything. So uh, for example, in this case, you can say, I'm going to learn about the uh, extent of the, of the full terms of period, and can look at the maximum frequency, and look at the, the torso, and can use all of this as features, right? Can use the range feature, the extent, or I can use the range Doppler, right? That's why this area is so ripe for uh, for contribution because there is no superior uh, method as of yet. Somebody say, oh, I'm going to use the contour here. This is range Doppler, right? How the range changes with the Doppler with the frequency. I can use this as a contour uh, as part of my uh, feature. So you can definitely use that. And uh, we run a simple experiment. We have falling, sitting, picking up an object and walking. <coughs> We're interested in the fall using the same radar that you should saw before. 6% uh, training, uh, testing, 40%. And we're able to show that uh, really, the, in terms of false alarms and detection, when you use both the range of Doppler, you get the superior uh, answer, superior uh, performance than if you use uh, Doppler only. So we'll stop here uh, to reduce false alarms to library. So the reason that this technology is not in the market yet, as I said before, is because the false alarm rates is still unacceptable to the end user. Joint variable domain feature extraction method, we talked about it. Took the expert results showing that the range doctor is superior. And then we hinted you by showing you the different signature of, of, the, of the leg looking from, uh, from the back or from front. Really, that's it's in its way to be used in the rehab and monitoring of motion abnormalities, especially with it. Thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm not used to this field at all. What's the acquisition time for scanning the house? Well, the acquisition time it depends on. on system. For example, the, uh, the vehicle mounted uh, is not a stop and go. It's not that it stops and fires and connects, then drives again. So this is, so they said that, you know, if you go for 30 miles an hour, so the Canadian defense goes for 30 miles an hour. So that's for the, now in terms of the handheld, that's very quick because uh, you're talking about uh, some of the systems for tracking motion, so actually do target tracking. So the acquisition time in many, many seconds. Yes, please. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, is there any consideration for the safety because uh, we do and the automatic way the energy? Yes, yes, excellent question. So, uh, in fact, that's how we are selling this technology for the, uh, for the elderly, we're saying that you know, the power is less than what is in form. So you're talking about 5 dpm and things. For the, uh, that's for the indoor. So the indoor safety is, has been established. So if you carry your phone, that's more dangerous to you than you have a radar looking at you. But from the outside, depending on the wall, because we take into account the attenuation of the wall, that's the size of the power transfer. But the, 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 the harm is, is not there. Is well, it's not ionized, so it's just not uh, a kind of, uh, strong microwave imaging. So uh, anything less than 20 dBm, you should not really worry about it because it, it, uh, there's no harm. Now, if you use your phone close to your brain, some studies say that could be harmful. That's not, we're not even getting close to that. Yeah, the same as when it depends on the uh, exposure time. Uh, how long you uh, ready to the person to, you know. Right, right, right. So, the, 
that's why in the, in the of course, for surveillance, it's the prison plan that stays there for 24 7, it's going to be just a few minutes. Because don't forget that for this application, the person has to be co -varied. For the indoor, that's an excellent question. For the indoor, the radar will be, if it's a radar for fault detection, will be asleep until it recognizes a potential fault event. So it will only be monitoring with very slow power. Or we have, uh, working with a company, you can use uh, infrared sensor, motion detection. When detect motion, it awakens the radar. See, now you can, you can take a look. So that is, it's, it is safe. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, have you compared against LiDAR technologies for the uh, indoor aged care application? And did I compare as well? Uh, LiDAR, um, basically laser scanning technologies. Um, and what's the uh, benefit and disadvantages of using LiDAR as opposed to radar? Well, probably, uh, we have, I haven't seen any study comparing uh, radar either, but I've seen lots of comparison between camera and radar. Uh, there are acoustic uh, sensing, uh, uh, the infrared. Now, uh, don't forget that we would like to resolve uh, multi-persons uh, in the room. So uh, those things that you saw, the handheld, there are different antennas inside that you do need for. So, now, I have to get a better understanding of how the spatial selectivity in a binder is. So it's not only the range I'm looking at. I'm looking into uh, a three-dimension resolution and elevation as well, and range. Uh, so you have to have an array. And those devices have an array built in. But I have not seen. Now, the Canadian, the Canadian defense, they use the binder to get them how far they, how far are they from the exterior wall. They use the laser to find out the distance between the vehicle. Why? Because they want to be parallel to the wall. So the driver, you cannot sway because the, uh, you, you, are, you are talking about uh, three gigahertz. A small deviation from the wavelength can kill your image. So they have a, they have a library to find out precisely how far they are from the exterior wall so they can maintain a parallel track. So that's the extent I saw by used. Any other questions? You showed a lot of simulations. What's the pattern between the simulations and the actual measurements? Excellent question. So <clears throat> the simulations we have, by the way, on campus are very strong arithmetic groups. But uh, we are uh, unable to simulate. This is uh, three billion. Uh, the, the way the, uh, that's two-story building. Right? Uh, so we needed to work with the Harvard research lab. That has, so they did the comparison between the regular model and the real model, and they did find out a fascinating uh, agreement. I don't have those slides with me, but uh, we have to send it to you. There had one experiment uh, where you see if, if, uh, if they drive this way, the, uh, the walls oriented in this way are difficult to do. So they uh, simulated, or actually they found uh, a building on the corner so they can drive this way, they found the horrible parallel walls and drive this way to find this part of the walls. Right? And they fused the images and they found out a very fascinating agreement. That's why they encouraged to continue on and use the vehicle and the modeling uh, as a vehicle for understanding the, uh, the phenomenology before they the building the systems. And sometimes you say it's not going to work, okay? Uh, the system I show you from uh, SAR from airport that shows you that if you're looking for people, uh, nobody is for this time. Yes, please. So what is the false acceptance rate right now? I mean, what, what sort of now values are we? An excellent question. So, 
you have to talk to the customers, right? I mean, I, I cannot say, well, 98% uh, uh, is acceptable, right? So the problem is, you know, you go and, uh, for example, how, how you do? What is out there in the market now? Push button. Right? Person falls, push the button. We say push the button is a problem, first of all, because they forget to wear number two. When we talk to the retirement facility, we found out that if a uh, husband and wife living elderly, let's say the husband falls, deliberately, they don't report it. Why? Because they get concerned that they will separate the two, they will take the, the husband in a more restrictive facility. Right? So uh, we have statistics that 40% of the people who fall don't push the bottle. Or the person living with them, they say, don't push the bottle, right? Okay. So we need something that completely outside their hand. Right? So that's the thing. Now in terms of accelerator, so forget push the bottle. Now you can, you know, there is accelerometer. Well, accelerometer, it measures the velocity. Well, it's the same thing I measured. Right? So, but the accelerometer, it is, you have to wear it. This way, it is out. They can report it, right. whether the person falling desires or not to report it. So the accelerometer doesn't have good uh, rating. We have statistics showing actually that it misses a lot. Right. Because depending on where you put, yeah. when you fall, in order to get the head, the head has a maximum doctor, you're going to put the accelerometer on, on that. So there's a great question. There are companies, by the way, that are taking very seriously. We worked on with two companies. Comcast is very interested. Comcast came with me and, uh, and other companies. Are looking into it. But to answer your question, uh, we have to talk to the, 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 the care provider. And there is a difference between independent living and people living in a retirement home. People in a retirement home, probably the false alarm can be higher. Because it's a, people are always monitoring each other, right? But people independent living, you say they cannot go wrong. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we also saw some of the papers and research work is in the area of uh, local uh, in, in this area using the Wi-Fi access points, for example, for current devices. What uh, are the Yes. So in my book, uh, there are 15 chapters, one chapter written by using the signal opportunity, which is the Wi-Fi. The radar is much more powerful than Wi-Fi because it's designated technology. You can design the waveform. For example, I showed you how the human scattered changes its frequencies. So I can design the waveform that best resonates the human. The Wi-Fi is a careless. That's not the main then, depending on where the Wi-Fi is, we're working with some very nice to look into the optimal distance of the radar, and also looking at a radar network. Because one radar device is not going to cut it. Because if you fall behind a fire cabinet, the radar is not going to see you. It's not going to see you. If you fall perpendicular to the radar side, the radar is not going to see you. So, the Wi-Fi is, if you use it, there's going to be a secondary task, a secondary motion. But you have a, a radar there that you have complete control of the distance, of the waveform, on the processing, on the bandwidth. Don't forget that. Talk about Dr. Bridge, Dr. Radar. Right? So it is 500 megahertz bandwidth. Where is the Wi-Fi that has five? All right, I think uh, um, it's been very, very interesting. If uh, people are interested, you can always email Professor Amin or you can email me as well. If you don't know his email, I can put you in touch with him. Um, thank you for your attendance and please thank with me Professor Amin again. Thank you very much.